I already said my piece in a previous video about how bad the WWE was in 2015 to me. One of the worst years that I can recall. Not the worst year, but on the short list, in the top four or five for sure. Now, with that said, though, maybe it's the wrestling fan in me. Maybe it's the, believe it or not, buried somewhere deep, deep down in the recesses of my colon cavity. Uh, my eternal optimism. But I still think there are some reasons for hope for WWE in 2016. Really, I do. Maybe one of the things I'll try to focus on in 2016 is even if it's bad and there are things that I want to hate on and talk about and rant about, I will still do that, obviously. Nothing's going to stop me from doing that. But maybe I'll do a better job every once in a while of trying to point out something that I like or something that could potentially be positive. We'll see how long that lasts, but hey, that's the idea. That's what I'm setting out to do in 2016. So... Starting off here at the end of 2015 with some reasons for hope for this company in the new year to come. Because I think there are some. There's probably five major reasons why I at least have some hope that the product will be better this upcoming year as opposed to what it was during 2015. First and foremost, there's nowhere to go but up in my mind. You can't get much worse than what we got. So even if it gets just a little bit better, it's going to feel markedly better, and I'll enjoy 2016 a whole hell of a lot more than 2015. And sometimes that's the thing, and sometimes that's a trick for the WWE, is to set the bar so low and make expectations so low that even if it's not that good, it still far exceeds the expectations that you had, and it fools you into thinking it's something a whole lot better than it actually is. And maybe, again, that was the genius of 2015. It's setting up 2016 well, not because 2015 was any fucking good, but because 2016 can't possibly get much worse. And I don't think it can. I don't even think the WWE could stumble into 2016 being worse, even if they try, even if they put their best foot forward. They could probably try to sabotage and make it worse and end up as a byproduct screwing it up and making it better. There's nowhere to go but up in my mind. So that's a good place to start. I do think, though, another thing that plays in favor of the product being better in 2016 is some of the returns that we should see and could see and probably will see. Uh, you think first for some of the bigger names, the part-timers, if you will. Brock Lesnar is about to come back into the fold, so you know he's going to at least be a major player uh, from the Royal Rumble to WrestleMania, and he'll be in there sporadically throughout the year. Part of what hurt the tail end of this year was once you got to Hell in a Cell, there was no more Lesnar, so you had one less reason to care, one less reason to watch. Well, Brock Lesnar is going to be heavily involved in WrestleMania season in some configuration in some way. Now, is he in the Royal Rumble match? Does he win the Royal Rumble? Does he main event WrestleMania? Does he just have a feature match at WrestleMania? That remains to be determined. But there's no question that when Lesnar's there, business picks up, at least from an entertainment standpoint and from a special attraction type of standpoint, just a little bit. Uh, the Undertaker, you would assume, is going to be back at some point in time in WrestleMania season. I mean, for God's sakes, the guy worked four pay-per-view matches in 2015. You would think he would at least work WrestleMania, and I think there's an outside chance that he might even work the Royal Rumble match itself. I mean, what a special treat and a surprise that would be to see The Undertaker be in the Royal Rumble match. I'm not saying it's going to happen or even likely to happen. It could be a possibility. I kind of hope it's a possibility. But, you know, Undertaker comes back WrestleMania season. That's another reason to care for me at least a little bit more the first couple of months of the year. The trick is how to follow it up afterwards. You know, you've got the announcement that The Rock's going to be involved with WrestleMania 32. Now, in what capacity, in what way, shape, or form, that remains to be determined. Are we going to go all the way with him in a match against Triple H? That's kind of where I hope they would ultimately go. But if they're going to go into a situation where he just makes some type of one-off or a couple of small appearances... It's still The Rock. Maybe for some of you that like it, maybe because it's going to be WrestleMania 32 and he wants to be on that big-ass show, maybe a Chris Jericho comes back. So you get some type of short-term boost heading into WrestleMania season. You know, you've got several other guys that are on the shelf right now with injury. Seth Rollins is going to come back from his major knee injury somewhere in the middle to late portion of 2016. So when he comes back, he's probably coming back as a baby face. You know, people are going to be happy to see him again. And you're going to have a guy that was such a big part of the product in 2015. He'll feel fresher. He won't be as overexposed. He won't feel as forced. He won't feel as overpushed. 
Um, it'll be nice to see him back. Cesaro will be back at some point in time in 2016. That will be good to see. Randy Orton will be back at some point in time in 2016. And I can say a lot of different things about Orton, but you know it's nice to have another player in the fold and another major player in the fold, and Randy Orton can still be a major player. So he's not there now. It most certainly doesn't help the product, uh, but when he comes back, it most certainly won't hurt the product either. And then, you know, there's always that big matzo ball hanging out there of Daniel Bryan. What's going to happen with him? And I have a feeling a lot of you would be, especially along with the Lexman, and he's most certainly not the only one, would be fooled into thinking things were a whole lot better than they actually were if Daniel Bryan was involved in the show on a week-in, week-out basis. Now, does that mean Daniel Bryan actually wrestles full-time? I don't know. But there's still that possibility of bringing back Daniel Bryan in some role, in some capacity in 2016. So I look at the return between the legends of the past and... Uh, the faces of now that are gone due to injury that could come back. And I say that the talent roster throughout 2016 could be a lot deeper, um, and that could be a very good thing. Now, you could also have that, you know, excitement that comes from some new faces. You know, it helped in 2015 that you got a new face like Kevin Owens into the fold. You know, that excited a lot of people. Similarly with the Divas when they brought up Charlotte and Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks. You know, that made a lot of people pining for better divas division and better women's wrestling in the WWE very, very excited. You know, it's always nice to get those new faces. Neville was another new face that did some nice things in 2015 in his limited exposure uh, in the way that he was featured. So maybe this year you're going to get some main roster call-ups such as Finn Balor, such as Sami Zayn, such as Colin Cassidy and Enzo Amore, such as maybe a Baron Corbin on the diva side, maybe somebody like a Bailey. you know. These are some people that the hardcore fans care about. These are performers that getting called up to the main roster could have a shot. Now, am I that sold on many of them really breaking through and becoming something? I don't know about that. But that excitement for those new faces could maybe help get you through that lull period that comes usually somewhere between WrestleMania and SummerSlam. Bringing in a Finn Balor, bringing in a Sami Zayn, bringing in Cassidy and Amori, bringing in somebody like a Bailey could be a nice injection of life into the product in the doldrums of the middle of the year that usually happens. Then I look at the next generation as well, and I see Roman Reigns is the champion. Dean Ambrose. You know, you've got Kevin Owens. You've got Bray Wyatt. You've got the New Day, especially Big E. You know, I look at some of these newer faces. I look at Neville as somebody, like I said, who's found a nice footing based off of the role that he's been provided. I think he's done very, very well with. I look to that next generation and I see some hope. You know, it doesn't have to just be about John Cena and Randy Orton and about Triple H. It could be about other people. It could be about new, fresh faces. And that's part of the excitement of the product is the fact that there's always that potential. And it's kind of cruel in the way that it teases us. Because we see the possibilities for what could be, and then we see the ultimate reality that does become of it. But, again, when you look at the new generation, you, know, you might not be excited about Roman Reigns being the champion, but give it time. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But maybe going later into the year at Money in the Bank, you've got somebody like a Kevin Owens or a Dean Ambrose or a Bray Wyatt that could win the Money in the Bank briefcase, and maybe they could be a champion at some point in time later in the year. They could be guys that are featured in big-time spots. And you would assume a couple of them will be featured in somewhat decent spots heading into WrestleMania. So there's some hope there that the WWE, out of necessity as much as anything else, has no choice but to really transition to that next generation, that new generation, because what else can they do? You know, and, that, and that leaves me hopeful for this company too. But as much as anything else, I think it revolves around the big shows that are going to come in 2016. You know, Royal Rumble, even if you're not interested in the product that much, the Royal Rumble is still the Royal Rumble. It's, it's your own unique night. It's its own unique event. It's that one match of the year that is truly different than anything else. Now, you could do other battle royals, but there is only one Royal Rumble. And this year, when I look at the Royal Rumble, there are all types of different possibilities, all types of big names that could be involved in it. It could be a really exciting Royal Rumble match. And then I look at WrestleMania 32. The company is going to try and set an attendance record. They're going to try and draw 105, 110,000 people to AT&T Stadium, that massive, magnificent shrine to Jerry Jones' ego and his $411 Dallas Cowboys. So as a result, there's a hope in me that with some of the returning names, the legends of the past, and some of the new faces 
and more particular that next generation that is here now that the company is going to do what they can and do everything in their power to make sure that that show delivers. Now, many of you have actually enjoyed the last two WrestleManias. I didn't enjoy 31 that much. I enjoyed 30 a little bit more, even though it still leaves me with a sour taste in my mouth, and I still view it as the yeah, but WrestleMania. But there's a part of me that deep down, maybe foolishly and naively, hopes that this company is going to understand how important WrestleMania 32 is, and they're going to be damned if they let it sink. They're going to do everything they can to make that show swim and be a great success, and I hope it does. So I've got that excitement hanging out there. You always have the excitement of the Money in the Bank match at the Money in the Bank pay-per-view and who's going to be that next Money in the Bank winner. And again, you've got some potentially intriguing, compelling options this year with guys like Kevin Owens, with guys like Dean Ambrose, with guys like Bray Wyatt. You know, there are lots of different directions that the company would go with that. You know, so it's another person that could potentially be elevated into a big spot. Maybe a returning Seth Rollins at that time for all the hell. Who knows at this point? Probably not, but who knows? You know, I mean, so that's got me excited too. And then I think about SummerSlam. And I could see there was at least some type of conscientious effort, at least from a mindset standpoint for the WWE, to try and make SummerSlam feel like the WrestleMania of the summer, like it's always supposed to have been. Now, granted, it seems like in large part they try to do that by making the show four hours, just like WrestleMania. Well, that's not enough to get the job done. But last year at SummerSlam, we got Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker. I mean, that felt like a SummerSlam main event. That felt like a special attraction. That felt like a big deal. And to me, I've got to look at the roster and the way things are structured, and I've got to think somehow, some way, whether it's John Cena and Roman Reigns and they wait until SummerSlam, they do something else involving Triple H and somebody, or Roman Reigns and somebody else. There's got to be maybe Undertaker and somebody else, or Brock Lesnar and somebody else. Maybe they do Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns too. Who knows? There is a lot of potential for a lot of possibilities for them to put on a good SummerSlam with a main event that feels like a SummerSlam main event should. So between the fact that there's nowhere to go, in my opinion, basically, but up, we've got a lot of people coming back in the fold at different points in time in 2016. You're going to have that next generation get another year to try and get themselves over and really take over the future of the WWE, along with some new faces being peppered in. And some of these big shows that I'm actually looking forward to in 2016, yeah, maybe it's the naiveness and the newness of the upcoming new year. It's got me feeling a little excited, actually. Sure, in a couple of weeks, I'll be down in the dumps and wondering why the hell I'm still watching this crap. But for now, don't kill my boys! Because I think there's reasons for hope, America, for the WWE in 2016.